Everything, the Buddha said, is rooted in desire. The problem is we follow some desires and we get the opposite of what we want. A lot of life is learning which desires we can follow, which ones we can't, where we can exert some control and where we can't. And these lessons apply to the practice as well. In his second discourse, the Buddha pointed out how the five aggregates are not under your control. But if they were totally outside of your control, one, you probably wouldn't identify with them, and two, you wouldn't be able to have any raw materials from which to make a path. So what we're trying to do here is find where are the limits of control and what skillful control is. And see how we can control the aggregates to turn them into a path to get what we really desire, which is a happiness we can trust, a happiness that doesn't change, a happiness that doesn't let us down, happiness that's totally satisfactory. It's always good that we keep that possibility in mind, because from that perspective we can turn around and look at the, the ways of the world and see that even the best situations out there are really lacking. When the Buddha wants to show how little control people have over their lives, he talks about kings. The canon will describe issues from kings. There's a case of King Basenity. He wants his favorite queen to love him more than she loves herself, but no, she won't. Here he is. He's powerful. He has the power of life and death. But there are a lot of things he can't get out of other people. There's one point where he complains to the Buddha. He's in meeting with his ministers, and they will interrupt him and argue with him, even though he has the power to have them executed. He can't even get them to stop talking so he can finish his sentences. That's control over the other people. Then there's control over your body. Now the case of King Garavya. You see, he complains to Ratabala. He's now 80 years old. There are times when he wants to put his foot one place and go someplace else. He has a disease and he can't order other people to share out the pain of the disease so he can feel less. He has to feel all the pain of the disease himself. It would be easy to talk about the disappointments and lack of control of life when you're talking about people who are poor and powerless. But the really good lessons are, come from the people who are powerful. You see how there are limitations even for absolute monarchs. You read in history, Napoleon was probably the most powerful person in Europe, and even he couldn't get his ministers to do what he wanted them to do. And we all end up old, sick, and dying. So there are limits to control. You turn and look at your mind. You get up in the morning, you plan to do X, and you find yourself later doing anti-X or non-X. But fortunately, the mind doesn't have to be that way. You can train it. We try to make, take advantage of that, because as the body starts disobeying us, we find that things outside are not going the way we want them to. Our sole recourse is to the mind, and it's fortunate that we can train it. One very basic lesson and John Lee gives is that when you're sitting down to meditate and there's pain in some part of the body, you don't focus on the pain. Now there'll be parts of your mind that if the alarm bells are going off, the red lights are flashing alerting you to the pain, but you have to ignore them. 
You have to find a spot where it's relatively comfortable to stay. And as for any thoughts that go off toward the pain, you have to say, nope, I'm going to direct my thoughts to the breath. I'm going to direct my thoughts to making the breath comfortable. And I'll evaluate the breath and evaluate the success of my efforts. Because the breath is something that responds to your intentions. It does have its limitations. Even in John Fuang, who was an expert in breath matters, had what they called breath diseases in time. He got these sharp shooting pains throughout his body. So there are limitations to what you can do with the breath. But before you give up, when you know there are limitations, you take advantage of what you can change. It's like being adrift at sea, and you find some logs that are floating in the water, and you know that eventually they may start to sink, but you hold on to them while they're floating. And maybe they'll get you to some place that's, that's safe, where it gets you to another log, and you can hold on to that. Because this is the nature of the path. It's a little bit rickety, a little bit unstable. After all, even concentration is something fabricated. It too will have its subtle ups and downs. But it's good enough to get you across, good enough to get you to safety. So you work with form, the form of the body, in other words, the breath. Learn how to relate to the form of your body. So you can have a good place to stay. Try to give rise to feelings of ease, even though there may be pains in one part of the body that they don't take over the whole body. If the whole body were in pain, you'd, you'd die. So there's got to be some place where you can stay, where it's relatively easy to stay, pleasant to stay. And then your perceptions. You ignore the flashing red lights. Stay with the perceptions of the breath as something that can permeate everything. It can flow in any way you want. And then you use your direct thought and evaluation to improve things. The way the breath is going, the way the mind is relating to the breath. You can make these adjustments. And then you can direct your thoughts to where there is still stress. When they talk about the different levels of jhana you can get into, there's a moment when you're going from one level to the next, when you step out a little bit and you're surveying what's still there that's causing an unnecessary burden on the mind. It's a little bit of thought, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit of direct thought and evaluation where you can see. What's going on that's unnecessary? What stress is unnecessary here? And what am I doing to cause that stress? If you can see the cause, and it will come together when slight rises and falling away of the level of stress. When, when it rises, what did you change? When it falls away, what changed? Look there for the cause. And then there's consciousness, which is aware of all these things. And this is how you take the aggregates and you make a path out of them. And the path may be makeshift. Remember the Buddha's image of the raft. You don't wait for a professional carpenter to come and make the raft for you. you. You put it together out of the twigs and branches and leaves that you can find, i.e. these aggregates. And then you hold on. Don't get discouraged, because this is your way across. Because if you stay on this side, you live in this world where we have our desires that turn on us. The more we try to exert control, the more things rebel. And 
it's not a good place to stay, even if you were a king. You'd run up against limitations. And the limitations could be pretty severe. But there is a path across. There is a way across. The Buddha talks of the path as being like a raft, as being like a vehicle. It takes you someplace better than this. But to master the path requires that you figure out what here you can control and what you can't, and how to control it in a skillful way. The aggregates can be brought to some extent under, under our control, but if you force them in the wrong way, it's like forcing people in the wrong way. The more you try to control them, the more they rebel. Fortunately, we have the lessons that the Buddha set out. When the Ajahns are passed down, you do have your breath. You can lay claim to at least some part of your body, some part of your mind. And as you get more sensitive to what you're doing, you find that you do have enough control to make your way across.